Mark Twain once said that history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it does rhyme. And uh, there's an interesting partial rhyme that I want to share with you by describing another regime other than the current regime in Iran. It's the one uh, that took power in January of 1933 in Germany. The uh, principal figure Adolf Hitler, had written in the 1920s in Mein Kampf <clears throat> of what his objectives were. To rule Germany, to kill the Jews, and to conquer Europe. And so we had Munich. And so we had Chamberlain return, smiling and raising the peace agreement that had been reached at Munich, saying that this meant peace for our time. To applause to general approbation that what at the time was called appeasement did not have a negative connotation right yet. It meant in 1938 pretty much the same thing that engagement means now. Talking seriously to your major adversary and hopefully reaching agreement with it. I mentioned that possible rhyme to point to a few parallels. Ahmadinejad uh, and the Iranian regime today have some of the same characteristics that the Nazis did in the 1930s. The other phenomenon that is taking place is, of course, the Iranian nuclear weapons program. If you do not believe that it is a nuclear weapons program, I have a bridge in Brooklyn, I would be delighted to market to you. The worst and most irresponsible national intelligence estimate ever, several years ago, confused its headline with its footnote. Its headline was that Iran had stopped its nuclear program, nuclear weapons program. The footnote said, oh, by the way, it's still enriching uranium. The enrichment of uranium is the long pole in the tent in designing a nuclear weapon or the reprocessing of the plutonium. That's what's hard. That's what takes time, not the design of the weapon. The claims that Iran makes in the course of its undertaking are quite parallel to the peaceful assurances that Hitler was giving in the 1930s as he built Stuka dive bombers and panzers. But these are for peaceful purposes. Yes, of course they were. And uh, of course, Iran's intention is merely to have enriched uranium for its nuclear power plants. It uh, is amazing to me the degree to which sensible people in different parts of the world have fallen prey uh, to that nonsense time and time and time again over the course of the last uh, number of years. Well, in addition to parallels in diplomacy and weapons buildup, there are some rhymes uh, with respect, of course, to Ahmadinejad's and the Iranian regime's uh, treatment of Jews and treatment of dissidents, treatment of Democrats, those who want a decent Iran, a decent Iranian government uh, uh, of all stripes. And certainly it has now come time for us to take a very fresh look at the way we are dealing with Iran. It um, would be, uh, I think, excellent if there were factions within this Iranian regime that one could work with. But I greatly fear that that horse long ago left the barn that it was not the case in 1997 
when a nod was made to a new Iranian prime minister that people had some hopes might be a moderate. I don't think it was the case then, and it certainly is not the case now. Those who depart from Ahmadinejad's and the Revolutionary Guards and the besieges thinking are sought out and killed uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, the chance of there being someone on the inside that we can work with, inside the regime itself, uh, is, I think, uh, slim to the point of vanishing. Once a negotiation gets going, just as to a hammer, a lot of things that aren't nails look like a nail, to a diplomat, and I've been one, quite frequently, a lot of things which aren't really opportunities to settle something look like opportunities to have negotiations and write reporting cables. And although one can talk with individuals such as foreign ministers, say, in an Ahmadinejad regime, one should under no circumstances be deluded into soft peddling things that need to be done in order to make that hypothetical negotiation succeed when the chances are as close to zero as things get in human uh, uh, endeavors. One thing we should no longer do, and in this I join the others on this panel, is keep the MEK listed as a terrorist organization. In 22 years of practicing law, I read a lot of uh, legal decisions. And uh, I recently read the circuit court's decision in the case involving the MEK versus the State Department. Uh, and I, my experience, and I think that of most lawyers who are interested in international matters, is that courts ordinarily give a great deal of deference to the executive branch with respect to the conduct of foreign policy. This uh, eloquently and well-written decision of last July by the D.C. Circuit effectively says quite bluntly, although it doesn't use this particular analogy, that what the Department of State has done is what the Red Queen does in Alice in Wonderland when she is asked if first we're going to have the trial and the verdict and then the execution, she says, oh, no, no, execution first, then trial. <laughs> so we need to incorporate that move together with a vigorous effort to work with those who want a decent Iran outside the country and inside the country. <laughs> Secondly, we should realize that although it means some pain to the Iranian people, the time is getting short. Stuxnet may have bought us a year or so, but it is not the ultimate victory over the Iranian nuclear program. <clears throat> we need to basically utilize Stuart Levy's excellent utilization of financial sanctions even more in an even more draconian way. I think what we need to do is to pull together the elements of a secondary boycott, essentially, of all companies in the outside world, especially those in Europe and Asia, that deal with Iran, other than by exporting food, pharmaceuticals, uh, matters, substances, and products that would relate to the basic needs of the Iranian people. Otherwise, if you are a German bank, or a Japanese construction company, and you are dealing with Iran, you should not be able to deal with the United States.
You should not be able to transfer funds through American banks. You should not be able to do anything. And the same... The same would go for subsidiaries of American or other companies that hiding under a foreign registration are in fact trading with the enemy. That needs to get squashed and squashed now. I think finally we need to realize that it is not 1933, it's 1938. And time is short. And the leadership of much of the Western world would like to dither. Churchill was indeed alone in the 20s and 30s, almost completely. Few friends, but almost completely alone because he alone saw what was coming and what needed to be done. And when Britain finally turned to him in May of 1940, nearly a year into the ongoing World War II, uh, it was very late. We were all very fortunate that they finally did and that we ourselves were able finally to come into the war and clean up an absolutely terrible world situation that had killed millions and millions of people in no small measure because of the dithering of the 1930s by leaders who bear, unfortunately, some rather strong resemblances to ones that we have had in the West in the last few years. So uh, it would be my hope that we would all be able to uh, work on these problems uh, together with a new spirit of urgency and a new spirit of commitment. Thank you very much.